Uh, this week I'd like to finish up what I started last week where I, we were talking about love as the foundation of everything in our lives as believers. Um, I had intended this as the third, well, it was intended to be the third message, not the third and fourth messages of the Bible conference, uh, just because in some of the things we were talking about, we were talking about things about the church and the family and some things that you know we, we might want to look at, uh, changes that need to be made, but... In spite of all that, uh, no matter what, what goes on, love is certainly the basis of it all. And we talked last week about uh, the love that started it all, God's love toward us. In uh, Romans 5.8, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us first. And uh, we also talked about our response to him and our love for him and our obedience. And then we started talking about the second great commandment, about God has told us that we are to uh, love our neighbor as ourself. And we were uh, examining, started examining the attributes of love in 1 Corinthians 13. <clears throat> Excuse me. 1 Corinthians 13, uh, because the definition of love from the Greek, as we had pointed out, basically boiled down to love being known, love being known by the actions that it prompts. Love is not a feeling, it's not anything we say, but the fact that we have love is shown, is evidenced by the actions in our lives. And that 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, show us the kinds of actions that, are, that, that show that love, that we have love. Uh, and again, as, as part of going through this, my intent was to have us all be thinking about any relationships that we have and the love that we need to exhibit in these relationships, uh, in our family, our, our spouses, our children, our extended families, our friends, and, and then even as Christ told us to love your enemies, these are all attributes that we are supposed to be showing even towards our enemies, even towards somebody like Michael Schiavo, which, who, who makes me very angry. Um, but as I was Thinking about him, some not very pleasant thoughts this last week. Um, I got sort of set straight by, I think I read an article where uh, a Christian man was talking about how our attitudes towards these people ought to be ones of love. and We should be praying for their souls. Uh, people that are lost, like we were at one time, if we're saved now, <laughs> he may still be lost. I, you know, that's between you and God. Uh, but when we're lost, we can't. We can't serve God. We don't serve God. We are, um, our father is the devil when we're lost and we serve him. And so we, even though it shocks us, it shouldn't surprise us when people act like sons of the devil because they are. And, uh, and our, our thought, as much as this was a, uh, uh, an injustice done to Terry Schiavo and her family, uh, we should be thinking of the souls of, these, of the people who caused it and praying for them and having a, um, as much as we dislike what they've done, we should, we should have a, our heart should go out to them because they need Christ. Just like at one time, if we're saved now, at one time we needed Christ. So anyway, <clears throat> we're talking about uh, some of the attributes of love from 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. And we'll read that scripture again at the end, kind of in summary. But uh, we had talked about suffering long, the, the uh, patience. And I just a brief comment. I remember I had mentioned that Patience or suffering long has nothing to do with fairness. And it is most emphatically about unfairness. We're talking about being patient uh, with people that offend us and injure us. That's what this word is talking about when it talks about patience. And kindness, uh, disposed to doing good for others. We talked about that briefly. To show oneself useful. And again and useful in how we act towards someone, in, in the things that we do for others. Um, not envying, not, not being jealous when others get something that, that we don't get, but being, being able to rejoice with people when they rejoice. Uh, not vaunting ourselves or puffing, being puffed up and, and arrogant and bragging. Uh, that, th those were the, the next things we talked about. And then the last thing we talked about last week was uh, love does not behave unseemly. Love is not rude. Love should be, love uh, 
does not be, behave in an unbecoming way. Uh, we said that definition meant love behaves in decent, suitable, proper ways that are suitable to time, place, and circumstances. Love behaves toward others as behooves their rank. We give reverence and respect to those above us, kindness to those that are below us. Love has courtesy and goodwill to all. And then I ended with the fact that, uh, I don't know who said this, but I, I read this somewhere that he, this person felt that some of the rudest people he knew were Christians or professing Christians. And, and that, is not, that should not be that way. We should be the, 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 uh, the people who are behaving in a seemly way, not an unseemly way. Okay, then we get to the, the next where we're going to pick up this week uh, is the next one. It says, love or charity seeketh not her own. The word to seek means to look for, to seek out, to try to obtain or to desire to possess. Um, so love does not inordinately desire nor seek after its own praise, honor, profit, or pleasure. Uh, Self-love is, of course, very natural. Um, even Christ said, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. It is understood that people love themselves. Everybody loves themselves. Even people who commit suicide who we sometimes think, oh, you know, they have such a low self-esteem and they hate themselves for doing it. No. Uh, people that get to the point of suicide love themselves so much that they're trying to put themselves out of their misery. Everybody loves themselves. So self-love self is natural. Um, but what, when it says, seeketh not her own, love seeketh not her own, we are not to seek our own to the hurt of others. Uh, love often neglects its own for the sake of others. It prefers others' welfare and satisfaction and advantage to its own. Again, our intent here is to be thinking of ourselves and our relationships and how we can be known as, we, well, whether we're known as it or not, whether we can be people in a relationship who love. So are, are, are we going to be people who neglect our own for the sake of others. When divine love controls our hearts, it will be others first instead of self. And, of course, that is just a common theme throughout all of this. There is no place for self here. Uh, seeketh not her own. This is realizing that everything is not about me. There are others around, and, you know, it should be about them first. Uh, when I was... In college, about 100 years ago now, it seems, I worked in the, in the cafeteria. I got a job up there, and fairly early on, I got to a, a somewhat responsible job working in the cafeteria. And so I worked up there for four years to try to put myself through school. Um, and I remember one time when they served, uh, one of the meal that they served was chicken. I baked chicken or fried, I can't remember exactly, but the batch of chicken they got was really, really tough. I mean, you could hardly eat it. It was so tough. And, uh, you know, you got college students. They're, um, well, they're college students. You got a, a dining room full of people, and people are fighting trying to eat this chicken, and all of a sudden somebody decided they'd had enough, and they threw their chicken on the floor. Well, of course, knowing college students, you, you, you know that everybody immediately jumped up and rebuked that person and picked up that piece of chicken, right? <laughs> Wrong. Everybody's, you know, it's like food fight time. It's like, ah, the whole place is throwing chicken all over the floor. And everybody thought that was just funny, you know. And, 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 and the next day, I, I had taken a, um, I was a math major, but I, you know, you got to take some classes that you don't want to take. So I had taken some low-level political science class and the next day we were in there and we were discussing, I don't even know what we were discussing, but it came up about, you know, expressing your opinions and different things. And this whole issue of being in the cafeteria and throwing food on the floor, you know, as a, as a statement, you know, of, how, of the fact that this, um, our rights have been violated or something because we got this tough chicken. And, and everybody was agreeing, and they're all laughing, and they thought that was hilarious. And, you know, I, I'm not the kind of person that likes to confront people, but... 
I'd had about enough of that garbage, and I, I finally raised my hand and said, you know, I work up in the cafeteria. Did anybody, I, I wasn't even a Christian then, I said, did anybody think about all the ladies that had to pick up all that chicken? I mean, you all thought it was so funny to throw it on the floor, but there was people that had to pick it up after you, and uh, I don't even remember what they said. I'm sure they probably thought I was a moron, but, um, but that, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, this is my right to express myself. You know, I, my rights have been violated because this chicken is a little tough. That is really awful. I mean, that's a bad life, I tell you. But that's the kind of thing, uh, you know, love would be in a position like that and would, would start thinking about the fact that there are other people around that, you know, perhaps I ought to be thinking about them and what they, what they might have to do as a result of my actions. Um, only a, a modern culture like ours would have a magazine called Self. Um, that's not a 1 Corinthians 13 magazine, I would imagine. I don't read that magazine, but I'm guessing that that's not a 1 Corinthians 13 kind of magazine. Um, <clears throat> common, very well-known verses in Philippians 2, starting in verse 4, where it says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now, we're not talking, you know, there are obviously, we have to take care of some things of our own, too. I'm not, I'm not advocating that we completely and absolutely ignore everything on our own. I mean, uh, that's not what God would be saying. But, but God is saying that we need to not only look on our own things, but be thinking of others, not just seeking our own. Um, this is followed, of course, by these verses that we read a lot about Christ. And starting in verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now that is the ultimate in not seeking one's own. And we can't even understand completely or even very much what it's like to be God and to set that aside and to come to earth as a man. That is, uh, that is our example. Love is also not easily provoked. That is the King James translation, not easily provoked. The Greek word to be provoked means to be greatly distressed or angered or irritated. It, it literally means to sharpen, but it's used metaphoric, metaphorically signifying to rouse to anger or to be provoked in the, Eng the English word. In 1 Corinthians 13.5, it, sh it should have been translated, love is not provoked. The word easily that's in the King James, there's no Hebrew, or excuse me, no Greek word in the text that corresponds to the word easily. It should say love is not provoked, um, is not made angry or offended. Um, it's, love would never be angry without a just cause and would try to confine its passions within proper limits so that it does not go beyond what is just. Um, it has been said, and I believe, that most anger that we have is unjust and comes from us believing that our rights or the rights of someone that we love have been violated. And if you think about that, try to think about, in, you know, think back over your life over the last couple of weeks, if you're, one of, if you're honest enough with yourself or myself, and think back about occasions where we were angry and, and, and see if that doesn't, doesn't bear out. Most of our anger comes because we feel like our rights or somebody's rights have been violated. And I haven't done it here because i got enough stuff prepared, but, it, you know, it would be interesting and it would behoove us to study sometime exactly what rights we have. I think we'd be surprised to find that we don't really have very many rights. Uh, other versions, oh, I had forgotten on the previous one, on seeking not our own. Other versions say not self-seeking, does not demand its own way, does not insist on its own rights or its own way. Uh, other versions about not easily provoked say uh, love is not provoked, not irritable or touchy. Love is not fretful or resentful. Love is not easily angered. Those are some of the other translations there. Uh, 
it goes on to say, love, charity, thinketh no evil. Uh, the word think, or translated thinketh, means to credit, or to count, or to reckon, uh, to compute, calculate, to count, to take into account, to, to make account of. This is the picture of somebody writing down and keeping track of all the little things that have been done to, uh, done to one, to all the wrongs done to it. So it means, therefore, to take an inv- love does not take an inventory or to take account of. It does not reckon up wrongs done to it or calculatingly consider the evil done with an eye towards retaliation. Why else would we keep track of the evil that is done to us except that we're looking to retaliate? A love does not keep track of real or imagined wrongs with the idea that someday they will be thrown back in the face of the one who did the wrong. Uh, you know, whether we're going to retaliate physically, you know, somebody punched us, we're going to punch them, or whether we're just going to store it up and be able to save it sometime to throw it back in somebody's face in the middle of an argument or whatever. Uh, that's, those are the things that love does not do. Um, I think of, uh, I must be off here a little bit. Thinketh no evil. Oh, thinketh no evil. Yeah, I'm sorry. We, we have a, a movie at home called Pride and Prejudice. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but we've got like the five-hour version of Pride and Prejudice, sort of the ultimate girly flick. But I, I like it, actually. <laughs> I hate to admit that, but it's an interesting movie. But there is a sister. It's a story of four sisters and, you know, some of their, some of their romantic... Uh, it's set in the 1800s, and so it's, uh, you know, them, the, the men that they get interested in and different things. But there was a sister, Jane, in there. She was always the, the one who wanted to believe the best about everyone. Uh, everyone else got a little exasperated with her, including me, because she always stuck up for the people and suspected the best motives. Anytime anybody did something, she would always suspect the best motives on their part. Um, even when uh, there was a, a man in there that... When he was finally proven that he had lied, he'd lied about and, and, uh, and, and dirtied another man's reputation. He had duped Jane's silly younger sister into going with him and had morally violated her um, and then extorted money from people to, to pay his debts so that he would marry her. Even when he had done all that, I mean, she was finally confronted with all these facts and had to admit that he was an evil man. But even then, after that, they got married and came back and visited the family. And even then, she was wanting to give him the benefit of the doubt and and believe the best about this guy that had done all these things to her younger sister. And and I'm sure, you know, I don't believe the people that made this movie necessarily were Christians, but that, I I thought about that when I was thinking about thinking no evil and and wanting to believe the best, as, as best you can, wanting to believe the best about someone. Other versions say uh, love does not take an account of a wrong suffered. It takes no account of an evil done to it, pays no attention to a suffered wrong, or hardly even notices when others do it wrong. These are other, I shouldn't say translations. Some of these are paraphrasings, but these are other versions of, this, of the Bible that, and what they say there. Love rejoiceth not in iniquity. Uh, the word rejoice means to rejoice. <laughs> Imagine that. To be glad or be delighted in. And and iniquity, of course, is wickedness or evil or wrongdoing. So love takes no pleasure in doing injury or hurt to any. It wishes ill to no one, much less will it hurt or wrong anyone, even someone who deserves it. It doesn't rejoice in the faults, failings, sin, or consequences of others. It takes no pleasure in something that is not right, either by God's standard or by what man knows to be right in his conscience. Um, Let me just read from Proverbs 24. Uh, Proverbs 24, 17. Uh, (sighs) Proverbs 24, 17. Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth, lest the Lord see it, and it displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. How many times are we looking for uh, the people that we don't like or the people that we consider to be evil to get theirs? And we just wait for it to happen so we can gloat. 
How many times have I wanted that person that went flying by me on the highway to get pulled over right in front of me so I could go by and go, ee, nee, 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 nee. <clears throat> I don't have this love thing down completely yet. Uh, love rejoiceth in the truth. Again, re to rejoice. Uh, love rejoices with the triumph of the truth, meaning that love is happy about what is right and just and true. Uh, this truth is not me me merely verbal truth, but sincerity and integrity of character. So this is what love rejoices in, in the truth. Uh, remember back when we had this little episode with... Uh, former President Clinton, uh, when he apologized to the nation well, for, what, for, for lying to us, and he made some lame excuse about what he said being technically true. Do you remember that? But, of course, the intent was to deceive. And, and you can be technically true, but still tell a lie. Uh, for example, if you were to discover some coloring on the wall at home and go to your children and say, all right, who colored, did you color on that wall with crayon? And the kids said, no, thinking to themselves, it was colored pencil. <laughs> you know, it wasn't crayon, it was colored pencil. What they said was the, technically the truth, right? But every child knows exactly what the parent means. So that, that is an example, that, that would not be rejoicing in the truth. Uh, Lies are deception and intending to deceive whatever the words say. I rem there was some liberal journalist that was defending Bill Clinton after this fiasco, and he said, I think you can lie about a lot of things and still be honest. <laughs> Sorry. I just don't understand some people. Uh, I, I can't remember what preacher preached the sermon, but I have mentioned it before. Uh, he preached a sermon back in the 19th century about honesty is only, you're only honest. You're only telling the truth if you tell the truth in little things. If you only tell the truth in big things, you have some ulterior motive. Like, I might get caught. I might get exposed. I can't get away with it. But it's the little things in life where if the truth comes out and you rejoice in the truth in the little things where you can't get caught, that will prove whether someone is honest. There was a story told of a man who uh, went through a drive through at a place like Burger King. I think it was a Burger King. And he was accidentally handed a bag that had the receipts of the day in it. Cash, all the cash of the day. And uh, he discovered this and he brought it back. And the manager, of course, was just absolutely excited about this. It had been discovered that this had happened, had no idea who this person was, who this money was handed to, and he brought it back. And so the manager was gushing over this guy him for being so honest and he wanted to call a local paper and get the story in the paper and the guy got real embarrassed and asked him please don't get the local paper here and then he whispered to him that the woman he was with wasn't his wife thanks for being so honest <clears throat> anyway uh, other versions say rejoice with the truth or rejoices when truth wins out love bears all things uh, the word beareth means to put up, to endure, to stand, to protect, to forbear. Uh, it means to protect, to protect or preserve by covering, which means to keep off something which threatens, to bear up against, to hold out against, to endure, to bear or forbear. And okay, so the literal meaning is literally to roof over. To, so figuratively, it means to cover something with silence, to endure patiently a wrong in silence. Um, to hold, okay, let's see, to, to draw a veil over wrongdoing as far as it can be and still remain consistent with one's doing, with one's duty. So the intent is not to cover up, you know, some wrongdoing if it has to be exposed. But if there's some wrong, something done that's wrong to you that, that it would do no good to expose it other than to make you feel good, because you got someone else. That's what it's talking about, covering over something uh, as much as possible within one's duty. Remember, 1 Peter 4, 8 says, Charity shall cover a multitude of sins. And that's what it's talking about. Again, it's not talking about denying our responsibility to make something known if the truth has to be known. 
But there are many things and times when we might be offended or things might happen to us when there's no purpose to make it public other than, again, like I said, to make ourselves feel better or to feel like we're getting back at someone. Um, okay, it doesn't mean that love ignores faults that are done to it, but it is not for blazing or publishing the faults of a brother until duty requires it. And I might add here, um, husbands and wives, duty doesn't demand us blazing our spouse's faults all over the world just because we happen to be annoyed. Um, I, I, I'm guilty of it at times, and although my wife doesn't have any faults, but if she were, I'd probably be guilty of it. Um, so um, it says, though such a man is free to tell his brother his faults in private, he is very unwilling to expose him by making them public. So again, as much as possible within our duty, we cover up the faults of others. You know, you know what's, what's, what's sad about that story is when you are honest like that, they're so shocked. Yeah. Doesn't, isn't, that, isn't that sad that, that it is such, to be honest is something that is part of the, you know, well, good for you for doing that. Yeah. Because it's inconvenient, you know, especially when you're already gone and you're somewhere and how, how easily we can justify, oh, you know, they're a rich company, they'll never miss it. It was their mistake. You know, if you can't be smart enough to keep track of this, well, then it's your own darn fault, you know, that kind of thing. Good for you. It, yeah. <laughs> okay, love bears all things. Okay, as best we can, we cover up the faults of others. Love believes all things. Love puts one's faith in or trust in one, in, in, the, in, the, in the one that is loved. Um to place confidence in. It signifies in, um, re- n- not simply... Uh, how do I explain this? Um, this is not just, uh, not just giving credence to... Oh, how do I describe this? I'm sorry. This is acting upon the, the trust that we have. Not just saying that we trust someone, but acting on the trust. Really... Truly putting our trust in someone and acting as if we trust them. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? You can say, I trust someone, but again, love is shown by the actions that it prompts. Actually putting someone in a position of having your trust and then going on and living as if you trust them. <laughs> Even if you, you know, worry that you don't have the, uh, the... And again, all of this is within reason. I mean, if someone has proven to be untrustworthy... Then you know it's not it's not talking about how just completely ignoring and being blind to that, but uh, but you have to be able to give trust to people. Yeah, Keith. If we say we trust someone, but then we don't trust them, that just go back to deceiving. Yes. And yes. <clears throat> yes. Good point. In this case, it would mean trusting someone so much that we would rely on them. In uh, you know in whatever situation, and give them credit to that they will do the right thing. Uh, it also means to entertain a good opinion of someone when there is no evidence to the contrary, and even if there is some dark evidence, if the evidence is not clear, love would trust as much as it reasonably could, and not automatically think the worst of people. Um, and, and again, this doesn't imply that you are gullible. Sometimes people believe Christians are gullible. But Proverbs 14, 15 says, The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. Okay, we still are to be prudent people. And if we get to the point where there's absolutely no way that we can trust, well, you're not supposed to, you know, trust in those situations. But again, this means believing in someone as, as much as we can. As, and again, goes, well, not automatically mistrusting uh, love, it says, love hopeth all things, to hope, um, to cherish a desire of good with some expectation of obtaining it. That's what this word hope means. It's an attitude of confidently looking forward to what is good and beneficial. So this, the meaning here, hopeth all things, it means that love always has hope of the best. It gives in to a bad opinion of someone only with the utmost reluctance. 
And when, in spite of its inclination, it cannot believe well of someone, it hopes well and continues to hope as long as there is ground for it. Uh, again, we're, talking, we're not talking about complete and utter gullibility, but even when someone has proven to be untrustworthy and proven that we can't really, we still, love was still going to hope for the best and uh, because God can always be working. Okay, love endureth all things. Uh, to per- endureth means to persevere, um, to bear up courageously under suffering. To endure, bear bravely and calmly, to stay under or behind, to remain, to bear trials, to have fortitude, to persevere. So this is all a picture of courage, someone faithfully remaining even in spite of ill treatment, bad times, whatever. This is somebody enduring where they're supposed to be, enduring in what they are supposed to be enduring. Love is willing to suffer for the sake of the one loved. And again... Um, other versions say, endures all things, always perseveres, endures everything without weakening. Okay, so we've gotten through 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. And what was the point? Again, I, I wanted to just urge us all, including myself, to think about these qualities in our own lives, in our own relationships uh, with all those um, around us. Let me, let me read just one more time through 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, and the hope is that we would be thinking about these qualities. Love is known by the actions that it prompts. These actions in our lives and in our relationships. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. And then it says, charity never fails, never faileth. Okay, these things are, you know... We can't do this perfectly in the flesh, okay? I understand that. But there is a, I believe, I guess I call it a classic tension in the scripture between uh, what is our responsibility and what is God's responsibility. And you can get into error if you go too far on either end. You know, if you, if you say this, well, this is God's responsibility to do this, and so I'm just going to go on and do what comes natural. And if God wants me to love, he'll make me love. That's the one end. The other end, of course, is the legalistic end that says, I'm responsible. I've got to do it all in my own strength. And, and, and both ends are equally wrong. We're talking about in the middle here where we have to be relying on God. And we have to, the, the number one thing about all this is our, first of all, our relationship with Christ. We have to know Christ as best we possibly can. That is the first thing. Because you can tell people, you've got to love, you've got to love, you've got to love, you've got to be patient, you've got to be kind, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. And if we don't know Christ and if we're just going on, we aren't going to be able to do it. We have to know Christ first. But we do have decisions to make. And in all of these things, there's really not very much of a place for self. This is a place where we need to take um, a 180-degree turn from where the world is. Uh, uh, IBM has a library, mostly technical kinds of books, but they have different books on management and all, but it's mostly a pretty boring library. But I was in there once a few years back, and I happened to, I don't remember what I was looking for, but I happened to stumble on uh, the title of a book that I, I just remember this. I don't remember what the, what the title was, but you know how sometimes they give a short title to a book and then they have a subtitle, which kind of says, or, you know, and it'll give you a little longer subtitle. The subtitle of this book was called, it was written by a woman and it was for working moms. And it was, the subtitle of the book was How to Love Your Children Without Sacrificing Yourself. There you go. There's the world's attitude. I don't know, how, how do you love without sacrificing? You don't. But the world is going to try to do it. And, and I could, without reading the book, I could tell you, it was going to basically lay out how you could have it all. You can have your career, you can do all this stuff, and oh, by the way, your kids will be better off in daycare. That's probably what it was going to say. You'll be better off with your kids in daycare, maybe, but, but 
Since it's all about you, that's okay. Luke 9, 23 says, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? Or might I add, or lose his children? Well, um, when the Holy Spirit brings it to our mind about these, uh, the qualities of love illustrated in 1 Corinthians 13, let's all use it as an opportunity to examine ourselves and our own relationships and see um, how we're loving and see and make some of those decisions that we have to make. And then also take that step to know Christ better because only when we know Christ as best we can will we truly be loving people. Let's pray.